Diverticular disease of the colon is one of the most common complaints related to colon pathology. Its wide array of clinical presentation characteristics can make the diagnosis difficult, especially in the elderly patient who has no known history of colon pathology or who may have never had a screening colon exam, such as a colonoscopy. As such, diverticular disease can present with pain and tenderness, bleeding, perforation, hyperactive bowel sounds, fever, nausea, vomiting, and many other complaints that could confuse the diagnosis as Crohn's disease, especially Crohn's colitis or even ulcerative colitis, or even colon cancer. Welcome to this presentation on diverticular disease of the colon. We'll talk about this disease, what we think causes it, how the patient presents, how it's treated, and the complications that can ensue as a result of untreated or chronic symptomatic diverticular disease. At the conclusion of this presentation, there's a small multiple choice quiz and a reminder. Under the paperclip icon, you'll find the required readings as well as a complete written transcript of this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Many patient presentations for diverticular symptoms will be seen and often managed by the family physician. The complications are usually treated by a general surgeon or a gastroenterologist. Here are some recommended readings for this presentation. While not required, all these chapters are provided to you as a PDF. The student with an interest in performing well on their examinations and preparing for their clinical surgical rotations will peruse all of these chapters. The other chapters are provided for reference. I strongly suggest that you read the first two listed here, Diagnosis and Management of Acute Diverticulitis, as well as Lower Gastrointestinal Bleeding. This disease will be seen and managed by surgeons, internists, family physicians, infectious disease specialists, and gastroenterologists. This is not a rare disease. You will encounter it commonly. The exemplary student will read these additional recommended chapters, helping to cement his or her knowledge of colon pathology in preparation for performing well during the surgical rotations, audition rotations, and or internship. This disease will be seen and managed by surgeons, internists, family physicians, infectious disease specialists, and gastroenterologists. Remember, learning objectives are provided for the use and guidance of the instructor to ensure all the salient points have been covered. Please don't limit yourself to just the learning objectives listed here. Look at the objectives on the required readings too. The first learning objective is, number one, describe diverticula in general, including the types, locations, and causes. Next, we'll discuss, two, the specific risk factors, anatomical defects, and the locations of various types of diverticular disease as not all diverticular disease is found in just the colon. Then I'll expect you to number three, list and describe the five most common complications, including their clinical presentations. Then we'll move on so you can learn to number four, recommend the best diagnostic studies used in evaluating diverticular pathology. Further, it will be important for you to number five, recommend the best treatment for specific diverticular diseases, and then finally, number six, describe the Hinchy classifications for diverticular disease. Diverticular disease can be difficult and frustrating to treat, both for the physician and the patient. One of the treatments is operative. At the conclusion of this presentation, you should, number six, be able to describe the common operative procedures used in the treatment of diverticulitis. Number seven, what is a Hartman's pouch? Number eight, what is a mucous fistula? Number nine, what is the incidence of diverticular disease? Number 10, further, what is Saint's triad? Number 11, what is a fistula? Number 12, describe the types of fistula most commonly seen in diverticular disease and how they're treated. In addition, we'll choose number 13, which antibiotics are appropriate to treat diverticulitis, and number 14, whether to use hypake or a gastrographin enema to diagnose colon pathology, and more appropriately, when barium should be used rather than gastrographin. And number 15, what is an ileus? A patient suffering from diverticular disease can present with abdominal distension. The cause, 
Well, besides the inflammatory response of acute diverticulitis, which can cause a significant amount of abdominal pain, the pain and distension can also cause an ileus. Think of an ileus as sick intestines that won't percolate or peristalsis their contents. Instead, the intestines just lie there, becoming distended, and in turn, this distension causes pain. Another reason for abdominal distension can be the diverticular stricture. We'll talk about this later and look at some images of diverticular strictures. If the colon has become narrowed, i.e. the stricture, then the feces can't pass through the narrowing in the colon, eventually causing a bowel obstruction proximal to the narrowed, i.e. the strictured area and segment. Thus, the patient then has abdominal distension. Diverticular disease can also cause massive lower gastrointestinal bleeding. As a general rule, diverticulosis bleeds while diverticulitis doesn't. Bleeding diverticuli from any portion of the intestine, the small bowel or the colon, can bleed massively. In the same manner, diverticuli of the small bowel can also become inflamed, a condition called jejunal diverticulitis. There is jejunal diverticulitis, ileal diverticulitis, Meckel's diverticulitis, cecal diverticulitis, and sigmoid diverticulitis. Remember though, it's the non-inflamed diverticuli that usually bleed. Almost any infection or source of inflammation within the GI tract can cause nausea and vomiting, but the vomiting from diverticulitis can signal a bowel obstruction, a perforation, or systemic sepsis. Nausea and vomiting are nonspecific presentation complaints and could, in reality, represent almost anything from psychological emesis to pregnancy to a bowel obstruction or to the side effect of a medication. Abdominal pain can be caused by an almost endless list of disease processes ranging from psychiatric causes, narcotic withdrawal, bowel distension from a mechanical obstruction, or even trauma. The pain alone from diverticular disease can be either acute onset or chronic. The chronic condition is seen and begins the slow development of a sigmoid colon stricture. And despite the relatively nice categorization of abdominal pain being with or without peritoneal signs, it usually isn't that obvious from the physical examination alone. Unfortunately, the Henschey staging system, and we'll talk more about that later, does little to help in the management and treatment of the patient. It seems to only serve as a classification system for the clinical findings and presentation of diverticulitis. And for that reason, it isn't all that useful. In fact, I never even heard of it in my 20 years of practice. Some patients with stage 1 diverticulitis may present with an acute abdomen with peritoneal signs and an elderly patient with stage 3 disease may have minimal symptoms with a CT scan looking much worse than the patient does. So what are diverticuli? Diverticuli are outpouchings or protrusions of a portion of the bowel wall through the muscularis. That would be a false or a pseudodiverticulum. Diverticuli can be classified as either true, that is if the diverticulum includes all layers of the bowel wall, or false diverticuli, and then further subdivided into pulsion or traction diverticuli depending on their etiologies. Perhaps most important, they can occur anywhere in the GI tract. The esophagus, i.e. a Zenker's diverticulum, which is a false diverticulum, a jejunal diverticulum, which can be either a true or a false diverticulum, and an ileal or a cecal diverticulum. What about a Meckel's diverticulum? Meckel's diverticuli include all layers of the bowel wall and as such are true diverticuli. Here's an example of jejunal diverticuli seen at surgery. The source is the New England Journal of Medicine, jejunal diverticular bleeding. The photos here show an esophageal diverticulum, a Zenker's diverticulum. This is a false diverticulum since it only contains mucosa and not all of the layers of the esophagus. Jejunal diverticuli and other small bowel diverticuli can be either false or true. If the diverticulum is of congenital origin, it most likely is a true diverticulum containing all the layers of the wall of the intestine. False diverticuli do not contain all the layers of the intestinal wall. Colonic diverticuli look like small outpouchings, or like peas glued to the outer surface of the colon. 
In this image, we see a segment of colon and the tenia of the colon with three circled outpouchings. The circles show the diverticuli of the colon. Here's an image of colonic diverticuli. The yellow arrow clearly shows the diverticuli on the colon segment. This segment of colon has experienced some elements of narrowing. Chronic diverticulosis can result in a stricture of the colon and subsequently cause a bowel obstruction. Please click on the link below to view the abstract of the paper entitled The Pathology of Diverticular Disease. Quite frankly, even though we often discuss the cause of diverticulosis of the colon as due to the consumption of a low fiber diet, the truth is we are not completely sure why patients get this disease. There could be an undiscovered hereditary component too. As we'll learn, alcohol consumption plays a role also. Here's an example of a narrow segment of colon, a potential stricture, and diverticuli filled with feces. It's difficult to ascertain the hypertrophy of the muscular wall contributing to this narrowing, but microscopically the hypertrophy is there. Because the most common diverticuli occur in the sigmoid colon, we'll spend most of this presentation discussing colonic diverticuli. Here are some questions we've already answered. What are they? Well, they're outpouchings of colonic mucosa. They can be either true or false diverticuli, the most commonly found in the sigmoid colon. What is their cause? Well, in short, we're not 100% sure of what the cause is. Most believe it's from increased pressure within the colon. However, this would not explain jejunal or cecal diverticuli where the peristaltic pressure is not as intense as it is in the sigmoid colon. How common are they? Diverticuli of the colon are very common. They are found usually between the age groups of 40 and 80 years of age, and about 80% of adults over 80 years of age will have diverticulosis. Most, however, will be asymptomatic. How are they diagnosed? They can be diagnosed in a number of ways colonoscopy examinations, barium minima exams, CT scanning, or even physical exam where they're often palpable as a firm, hard mass in the left lower quadrant. This can be confused for constipation. Other symptoms? Sure, but most patients with symptomatic diverticular disease will complain of a dull ache or sharp pain in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. The pain can be an acute onset, and associated with a low-grade fever, nausea, vomiting, and changes in bowel habits with narrowing of the stool, i.e. the pencil-thin stool. We'll talk about the common complications and how we treat diverticular disease in the upcoming slides. We believe the cause of colonic diverticuli is a result of increased pressure within the lumen of the colon, which, in turn, causes a herniation of the mucosa and submucosal layers of the bowel wall through the weakest points between the longitudinal tinea coli muscle bands and between the circular muscle rings where the blood vessels penetrate the colon wall. If you look at the image here, you can see the diverticuli usually occur between the tinea where the blood vessel penetrates the mucosa and submucosa and leaves a weak spot, at least in theory. Association with a low fiber diet, i.e. the refined western diet, which some believe also causes constipation, spasm, and increased intraluminal pressure, especially in the sigmoid colon, is often attributed as the cause for diverticular disease. An elevation in elastin has also been attributed to the cause. According to the required reading, quote, a diet containing refined carbohydrates and low fiber substance, such as is currently widespread in many developed countries, especially in the West, has been associated with elevated elastin levels, which are commonly noted at colon wall sites containing diverticuli, and this change causes shortening of the tinea. So again, what exactly are diverticuli? Well, we learned in the previous slide they're herniations of the mucosa and the submucosa through the muscle layers of the colonic wall. In fact, we can see they clearly occur adjacent to the tinea and most commonly between the anti-mesenteric tinea. In fact, our reference states, diverticuli are small outpouchings of the colon that occur in rows at sites of vascular penetration between the single mesenteric tinea and one of the anti-mesenteric tinea. At the sites of most diverticuli, the muscular layers are absent. 
Technically, such lesions are really pseudodiverticuli. It's interesting, this paper cites they occur between the single mesenteric tenia and one of the anti-mesenteric tenia. Thus, colonic diverticulosis represents pseudo, or false diverticuli, since the diverticulum does not include all of the layers of the bowel wall. In fact, here we clearly see the circle where the blood vessel penetrates all of the bowel wall layers, yet a diverticulum has not occurred at these weak points. If we look at the anti-mesenteric tenia, we'll notice in this photo a diverticulum has occurred between this mesenteric tenia, but not through both anti-mesenteric tenia areas. We still do not know the cause of this, and these findings are likely of little clinical significance. Remember, however, the sigmoid colon does have its own mesentery and is considered intraperitoneal. Does this help explain the cause of or location of diverticular disease of the sigmoid colon? Here's a photo micrograph taken from a pathologist presentation on the histology of diverticulosis. We see a diverticulum extending through the muscular layers and can see the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis. This appears to be a true diverticulum and not one secondary to increased pressure. This most likely is a photomicrograph of a congenital diverticuli because we can see all layers of the bowel. Now let's look at the next photo. In this image, we see a diverticulum which has no muscularis covering. We can see the mucosa and the submucosa devoid of any muscularis covering the diverticulum. This is a pseudodiverticulum filled with feces and is most likely an acquired colonic diverticulum. Interestingly, a paper entitled Diverticular Disease, Evolving Concepts in Classification, Presentation, and Management goes on to cite there is evidence highly suggesting a high fiber diet, which is often our treatment for patients with diverticular disease, and the associated frequent bowel movements were in fact associated with a greater and not a lower prevalence of diverticular disease. Obviously, it's clear we don't know the exact cause of diverticular disease. Should we be recommending a high fiber diet? Should we be recommending alcohol abstinence? Should we routinely study each colon section segment for elevated elastin content? I strongly suggest you click on the Adobe Acrobat icon to read the source paper. I'm pleased to see a paper suggesting alcohol consumption as a risk factor for the development of diverticular disease. In my clinical practice, it appeared most, but not all of my patients, who presented with symptomatic diverticular disease of the colon, perforation, or diverticulitis, were usually consummate users of alcoholic beverages. Interestingly, this article points out the overall prevalence of diverticulosis was about 33% in the subject studied. This study also found diet, body mass index, i.e. obesity, lack of physical activity, and bowel habits were not associated with the disease despite the common teaching obese individuals who consume a refined diet are at risk for diverticular disease. Interestingly, this paper found increasing prevalence of diverticulosis with higher alcohol consumption, thus making a strong correlation with national per capita alcohol consumption rates. Their final conclusion was alcohol use is a significant risk factor for colonic diverticulosis and this relationship may offer a partial explanation for the existing east-west paradox in disease prevalence and phenotype. As already seen, diverticuli of the colon can be diagnosed on physical exam where it can present as a tender, palpable left lower quadrant mass. It's also possible to diagnose diverticuli via colonoscopy, barium enema, or CAT scan. Diverticular bleeding, which is usually arterial, can be diagnosed via colonoscopy or by a nuclear medicine bleeding scan. Sometimes angiography is needed to localize and treat an area of profusely bleeding colonic diverticuli. Of course, at surgery, diverticuli can also be diagnosed. Bleeding diverticuli, if not localized before surgery,
are very difficult to localize in the operating room, and every attempt should be made by the gastroenterologist or the surgeon to localize which diverticulum is bleeding before the patient is taken to the operating room. Remember, esophageal diverticuli, such as a Zenker's diverticulum in the proximal esophagus, diverticuli in the mid-esophagus, i.e. traction or pulsion diverticuli, and small bowel diverticuli are best diagnosed with an upper GI series and small bowel follow-through, or capsule endoscopy, push endoscopy, or CT scan. Bleeding from small bowel diverticuli, usually jejunal diverticuli, can be addressed with a bleeding scan, capsule endoscopy, angiography, or push endoscopy. Push endoscopy refers to cannulating the small intestine with an upper endoscope. The endoscope has two balloons, one on the end of the endoscope and another, more proximal. As one balloon is inflated against the small bowel wall, the other is deflated, allowing the endoscope to be pushed through the small bowel, using the two balloons together in tandem to cannulate and view the small intestine. Not all medical centers offer push endoscopy. A photo of such an endoscope is shown here. This contrast enema shows diverticuli in the sigmoid colon, the large red arrows, and significant diverticuli in the transverse colon, the large red ellipses. If you look carefully, contrast filling the appendix can also be seen. Using barium, while significant diverticuli are present, risks the possibility of barium becoming impacted within the diverticulum, and just like stool with time, it can cause pain, diverticulitis, or erosions. You'll commonly see patients who have impacted barium in diverticuli, even though the barium enema was done months prior. Here's what diverticulosis looks like through an endoscope during a colonoscopy. I've labeled the lumen and use arrows to show the protrusions or the outpouchings and how they appear from within the colon. I've also circled a small polyp. Please click on the video to watch a one and a half minute video showing colonic diverticulosis. Remember, the tinea of the colon only go as far as the pelvic peritoneal reflection and diverticulosis will not occur in the rectum or below the pelvic peritoneal reflection down deep in the pelvis. Colonic diverticulosis is limited to that portion of the colon above the peritoneal reflection, i.e. more proximal colon than the rectum. Does this suggest to us anything about the cause of diverticulosis? I don't know. Diverticuli can be found throughout the entire gastrointestinal tract. In the colon, they are most likely seen in the sigmoid colon. Colonic diverticuli of the ascending colon is seen in only about 15% of people. In this image, we see an inflamed cecal diverticulum. Acute cecal diverticulitis can be easily confused with acute appendicitis, especially if the cecal diverticulum is small. If the surgeon encountered this patient, he most likely would perform a resection of the cecum, removing the appendix at the same time, and perform a primary anastomosis. This image shows a fecal lift. The cecum can clearly be identified as being full of oral contrast. Initially, this patient would be treated with antibiotics, and if there was no clinical improvement, resection of the cecum would be required with removal of the appendix too. In this image, I labeled the small bowel and the tinea of the large bowel. Here we see sigmoid diverticulosis, and each diverticuli has been circled for identification. As I mentioned, diverticuli can occur anywhere in the GI tract. A Zenker's diverticulum of the esophagus, duodenal diverticuli, small bowel diverticulosis, and even diverticuli of the ascending colon and cecum. As mentioned earlier, diverticuli can occur anywhere in the GI tract. Here is an excellent example of a large diverticulum with associated necrosis the necrosis appearing at the junction between the terminal ileum and the cecum. The appendix can be seen too. The CT scan shows colonic thickening with haziness in the pericolonic fat consistent with cecal diverticulitis. Cecal diverticulitis also has its own grading system, yet like the Henchy classification system, it's not really helpful in determining the proper treatment. We'll take a look at the Henchy classification system in just a little bit. We mentioned that 80% of the population, 
older than 80 years of age have significant colonic diverticuli. Yet, less than 25% of people with diverticulosis will actually develop an episode of diverticulitis, i.e. symptomatic diverticulosis. Data suggests patients with diverticulosis who develop diverticulitis is low, especially if they've never had a symptomatic bout of diverticular disease and have reached a ripe old age. In other words, the longer one goes without diverticulitis, the less likely it becomes you'll have symptoms from the disease. Please see the attached ACS surgery article. I've added the A here because otherwise the quotation as written did not make sense. If one has symptoms of diverticulosis, i.e. constipation, pain, bleeding, perforation, abscess, etc., then by definition you have symptomatic diverticular disease. A little confusion of semantics. Remember though, in other words, the longer one goes without diverticulitis and you have the disease, the less likely it becomes you'll have symptoms from the disease. More than for any real reasons, other than for statistical reasons, we must learn about Saint's triad. This is a relationship found between gallstones, the coexistence of a hiatal hernia, and diverticular disease. While making for good surgical trivia, it really has little diagnostic or therapeutic value. According to the chapter on diverticulitis, we find, quote, several factors appear to promote the development of diverticular disease and its complications, including decreased physical activity, obesity, and an intake of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, smoking, and constipation from any cause, i.e. diet or medications. The well-known Western affliction of gallstones, diverticulosis, and hiatal hernia frequently occur together, the St. Triad. Obesity has been associated with the intake of low-fiber diets, and growing numbers of young obese patients with diverticulitis are being seen by physicians. Consumption of nuts, corn, and popcorn does not increase the incidence of diverticulitis or diverticular bleeding. Interestingly, our chapter tells us that there is an association between decreased physical activity, obesity, and a low-fiber diet. Yet, the paper described earlier, which I alluded to, questions those very factors as to the cause and contribution to diverticular disease. It would appear that more research is necessary. Thus, the Saints triad is of no real use in diagnosing the patient. In fact, it suggests the diseases associated with Saints triad, incorporating any hernia, not just a hiatal hernia, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, high blood pressure, an aortic aneurysm, and diabetes may also be contributing factors. Thus, hernias, i.e. some sort of systemic connective tissue disease, may be responsible for Saints triad and the development of diverticular disease. Perhaps an elevated elastin level will be able to explain this. Diverticulosis may be a collagen vascular disease after all, as suggested by its association with hernias. Here, in Saint triad, it's associated with hiatal hernias, but perhaps other hernias will have a relationship too. Diverticular disease can cause massive lower gastrointestinal bleeding. Inflamed diverticuli rarely, if ever, bleed. However, diverticulitis, acute inflammation, can present with fever, elevated white blood cell count, localized lower abdominal pain, usually in the left lower quadrant, constitutional GI symptoms of diarrhea, constipation, and even obstruction. If a fistula is present, the patient can have air in their urine, called pneumaturia, or feces in their urine, fecal urea or even simply have symptoms of urgency and frequent urination, or recurrent urinary tract infections if the involved colon segment abuts the urinary bladder. Many times, left-sided sigmoid diverticulitis is referred to as a left-sided appendicitis. Many a surgeon has been fooled into thinking their patient has appendicitis when they actually have diverticulitis, and vice versa. So what are common complications of diverticular disease? You should memorize these as you will encounter them many times in your career. Bleeding from diverticulosis can be massive, and as a general rule, diverticulitis does not cause bleeding. 50% of diverticular bleeding can actually occur 
from diverticuli present in the right colon. Abscess formation is common and rupture of the abscess may cause a perforation. Subsequently, sepsis can also occur. As the inflammation occurs repetitively, hypertrophy of the muscle layers can cause narrowing of the colon and form a stricture, leading to a colonic obstruction. Fistula can also form. The most common fistula is an abnormal communication between the colon and the bladder, a colovescal fistula. But a fistula can occur between the colon and the uterus, or the colon and the colon, eroding into another segment of colon, or even into a segment of small bowel, a coloenteric fistula. A coloenteric fistula can cause hyperactive bowel sounds, loud borborygny, bloating, pain, and obstruction. You should memorize these, just like this, in a list. Thus, here we see an image showing us the common complications of diverticular disease. Number one, an abscess as the result of localized infection. Number two, stricture formation. As a result of long-term inflammation, number three, perforation of the diverticulum either into the mesentery where it is contained or free into the peritoneal cavity where it can cause peritonitis and sepsis. Number four, bleeding from non-inflamed diverticuli is relatively common in the elderly patient. And of course, number five, fistula formation between the colon and adjacent organs. The Hinchy classification is a relatively new introduction in the vocabulary of diverticular disease. It helps us describe the severity of disease but is unfortunately not really useful for guiding treatment. An abscess, which occurs secondary to acute diverticulitis, that is, walled off within the mesentery, either from the acute inflammatory process or from a microperforation, is graded as stage 1. Stage 2 shows a large pelvic abscess encompassing a great deal of the mesentery. This large pelvic abscess is usually the result of a sealed off perforated diverticulum leaking into the mesentery and thus preventing spillage of bacteria, i.e. feces, into the peritoneal cavity. Most of the organisms are gram-negative, i.e. E. coli and bacteroides species, and anaerobic bacteria. Stage 3 is a result of purulent peritonitis either the result of leakage of pus into the peritoneal cavity from perforation of the abscess or perforation of the diverticulum itself with spillage of gross feces into the peritoneal cavity. Gross perforation of the diverticulum with spillage directly into the peritoneal cavity, whether it's associated with an abscess or not, is graded as stage 4. Stage 4 does not require the presence of an abscess, only the presence of local fecal spillage directly into the peritoneal cavity from a perforated colon. Unfortunately, none of these classifications helps determine which treatments are appropriate. Here are images taken from my personal files. An 80-year-old veteran presented with a palpable mass in the left lower quadrant. He had tenderness, a low-grade fever, mild leukocytosis, and was a lifelong user of alcoholic beverages. CT scanning was inconclusive for cancer or diverticulitis as the patient had never had a previous colonoscopy. The CT scan only showed inflammation in the sigmoid. The radiologist felt cancer was a possibility. Colonoscopy was performed on this patient showing pus within the multiple diverticuli consistent with a diagnosis of acute diverticulitis. Usually the presence of acute diverticulitis is a contraindication to a colonoscopy as the risk of an inadvertent colon perforation could occur. However, in this patient, whether he had cancer, diverticulitis, or even ischemic colitis was unclear and the eventual treatment would, be, would depend on obtaining an accurate diagnosis. Here's an image of inflamed colon. The entire colon appears to have areas of mucosal erythema, irritation, bleeding, and inflammation. While there is evidence of diverticulosis on this image, whether this represents acute diverticulitis or alternatively colitis, either ischemic colitis or even Crohn's disease is unclear, hence the reason for colonoscopic surveillance with biopsies of the mucosa in such patients. These images show acute diverticulitis. The image on the left, with the yellow ellipse, 
shows a segment of resected colon with an area of inflammation, induration, and erythema consistent with an acutely infected and inflamed diverticulum. The CT image in the center, despite the spelling error, shows mesenteric inflammation. The bowel wall is thickened, and there is a small amount of fluid contained within those inflamed strands of mesentery. The image on the lower right shows an area of thickened sigmoid colon, the red arrow, while the blue arrow points to some hazy inflammatory changes in the pericolonic fat, consistent with acute diverticulitis, without rupture. Remember, when reading CT scans, fat becomes hazy in appearance. It's a sign of inflammation. Here are more images of diverticular changes. The image in the upper left, the red arrow, points out thickened bowel wall, while the blue arrow shows a hazy inflammatory response. The two images in the lower right reveal acute diverticulitis without perforation of the descending colon and an element of fluid surrounding the descending colon, the large white arrow pointing to a black lumen of bowel. CT scan images again showing acute diverticular changes. The thickened bowel wall is readily apparent on the upper left image. The upper right image with the red ellipse reveals an area of thickened, chronically hypertrophied and indurated bowel wall. Diverticular changes, the curved U-shaped arrow in the lower colon, shows again thickened edematous bowel wall with abscess changes seen within the mesentery. The image in the lower left where the red circle is reveals a small diverticular abscess. The right lower image shows a small amount of oral contrast, probably gastrographin, moving through an area of very narrow colon consistent with a stricture. Here an operation being performed laparoscopically shows an acutely indurated and perforated area of colon with external fat creeping over the perforation in the body's attempt to cover the perforation and limit the sepsis. A perforation is a complication of acute diverticulitis. You can also see small areas of feces contained within adjacent diverticuli, the red arrows, in this colon segment. In this segment of colon, the perforation seems to have been partially contained by the pericolonic fat. In this image, we see how an abscess cavity contained within the pericolic fat has perforated into the peritoneal cavity. The perforation is marked by the dark necrotic area of colon and the associated perforated diverticulum is seen within the colon itself. Most likely this was a long-standing area of chronic inflammation and induration eventually rupturing. This patient presents with free air under the diaphragm. The arrows show the muscular rims of the diaphragm and you can see air over the liver but under the diaphragm. The same is appreciated under the patient's left hemidiaphragm where you can identify the gastric bubble and a separate rim of air under the muscular edge of the diaphragm. This patient has a surgical emergency secondary to perforated diverticulitis. The operation will most likely be a sigmoid resection and a Hartman's pouch i.e. a rectal mucous fistula. We'll discuss surgery in a bit. Here's a patient who has such a large amount of free intraperitoneal air, it's actually causing a tamponade of the vena cava, pushing the liver towards the midline. Air outlines the liver, the gallbladder, and the spleen. When opening this patient's abdomen for surgery, the blood pressure will most likely immediately improve once the tamponade on these internal organs is relieved. Another complication of diverticulosis is bleeding. Here we see three separate images of diverticular bleeding. Often this bleeding is massive and occurs in, usually in elderly patients. As we learned earlier, 50% of these bleeds will occur in the right colon. If you click on the top video link provided, you'll learn how diverticular bleeding can be treated using colonoscopic interventions or injection therapy with saline or an epinephrine containing solution. Remember, diverticulitis does not bleed but diverticulosis can and does. The reason the blood vessel begins to bleed at the base of the diverticulum is not clear, although it's suspected to result from the friction of a fecal lith contained within the diverticulum.
However, there's no feces seen within any of these images. Likely, like a nosebleed, it was spontaneous. Luckily, like a nosebleed, most will stop without the need for any surgical intervention. Diverticular bleeding is often diagnosed by colonoscopic exam. However, if the patient has too much blood in the colon, it may be necessary to perform a bleeding scan. In this image, the black arrows show an area of active bleeding in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen, image 15. We can see how the radioactive chemical bleeds into the colon and traces the outline of the transverse colon. Again, look at image 15. The patient most likely has bleeding diverticulosis with the affected diverticulum near or at the splenic flexure of the colon back bleeding into the transverse colon. This patient will be treated by either colonoscopic clipping of the bleeding vessel, surgical resection, or injection of saline and or epinephrine solution by the gastroenterologist during colonoscopic intervention. Remember, in order for bleeding to be seen on a nuclear medicine bleeding scan, the blood loss must be at a rate of about half a cc per minute. In this example, we're shown a mesenteric angiogram showing a small blush of contrast from a bleeding diverticulum. Remember, this is an arteriogram, not a venogram. You should be able to name most of the major arteries here. Most diverticular bleeding will stop on its own. This is a frustrating clinical problem. Many gastroenterologists will want to stop the bleeding immediately. However, diverticular bleeding is often like a nosebleed. It starts and stops without any obvious precipitating factors. The patient often has no associated abdominal pain and presents with a significant amount of bright red blood per rectum. The patient may be hypotensive or normotensive. or if elderly, even hypertensive. Most of this bleeding will stop without any intervention and the surgeon must carefully assess the candidacy of the patient for operative intervention if conservative treatment fails. Greater than 80% of patients with acute diverticular bleeding will stop without any intervention. The patient may have a necessity for angiographic control, colonoscopic attempts at hemostasis, or even surgical resection as a last resort. Sometimes, for many elderly patients who present with diverticular bleeding, it is less risky to transfuse the patient than risk operative complications. At one time, barium was actually used. It was instilled into the colon to stop diverticular bleeding. The idea was to pack the diverticuli with barium and, as it hardens, form a pressure seal on the bleeding diverticulum hopefully tamponading the bleeding vessels with the weight of the barium column. We don't recommend this anymore because our interventions are so much better and of course barium impaction can lead to further clinical problems and necessitate a colon resection all by itself. Another complication of diverticular disease is the formation of a stricture. In this barium or gastrograph and contrast radiograph, we see diverticuli in an area of narrowing. Without reviewing the other films in this series performed under fluoroscopy, it's not possible to say whether this is an actual spasm, i.e. peristalsis, or an area of narrowing secondary to chronic diverticulitis and hypertrophy of the muscular layers of the colon wall. Nevertheless, if the spasm does not open up during filling of the colon with contrast material and continues to stay narrowed, we can assume safely it's a permanent stricture. This can cause a bowel obstruction with associated nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and abdominal distension. All of these symptoms are related to those schemes. The difficulty in using contrast studies of the colon to diagnose a stricture is that it does not completely rule out a narrowing from colon cancer that, as you know, can appear as an apple core lesion. Apple-core lesions are also basically strictures secondary to the intraluminal growth of the cancer. In these two images, we see areas of narrowing circumscribed by the red ellipses. The image on the right demonstrates leakage of contrast out of the colon and back into the colon consistent with a colocolonic fistula. 
and distal to this fistula, marked by the black arrows, a colonic stricture. The image on the left shows a narrowing in the colon consistent with stricture, but there are so few diverticuli seen in this colon, the clinician must be astute and will need to perform colonoscopic attempts to obtain biopsy in order to rule out cancer as the cause of this narrowing. Here, a contrast enema shows a few diverticuli in the sigmoid colon, but an area of severe narrowing is noted. Depending on the patient's symptoms, urgent surgery or an elective planned operation may be needed, the result of a large bowel obstruction from an underlying stricture. This patient may actually require a colostomy. Fistula formation is another complication of diverticular disease. We did see a colocolonic fistula earlier. The most common fistula is between the sigmoid colon and the bladder. The patient presents with suprapubic pain, often urinating air, pneumaturia, or urinating feces, fecal urea. In the image on the upper left, a graphic is shown demonstrating a colovescal fistula. The middle image shows contrast leaking from the sigmoid colon and filling the bladder, the red ellipse, consistent with a diagnosis of a colovescal fistula. The image on the upper right shows air in the bladder consistent with a colovescal fistula. Of course, the image in the lower right shows the bladder grossly filled with contrast consistent with a large colovescal fistula. These require operative intervention, usually a colon resection and repair of the bladder. Most colonic diverticuli are incidental findings and never become clinically significant or require treatment. It's the clinical presentation of the patient that determines the workup and the treatment. Further, the cause of diverticulosis, once believed to be caused by increased pressure from constipation or eating low residue diet, may now be linked to alcohol and fiber supplements once the mainstay of treatment may contribute to the worsening of the disease. We discussed all of this earlier. Other treatments, such as Miralax, which is a polyethylene glycol substrate, may replace fiber supplements in helping patients maintain bowel regularity without increasing the complications of diverticular disease. Some patients have actually developed fiber cast of their entire colon because of the lack of the patient's mobility, non-stop, unchecked use of fiber supplements without adding proper hydration or without increasing or improving the bowel movement frequency. Actually had a patient in residency who had chronic diverticular disease and was given daily doses of Metamucil and developed an impaction of Metamucil of his entire colon. Continuance of colon screening via colonoscopy is encouraged for all patients over 50 or in those with a family history of colon cancer. The age of the first degree relative diagnosed with colon cancer minus 10 years. For example, if your father was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 45, you would expect to receive your first colon screening exam as their son or daughter at age 35. I hope this makes sense. The treatment for acute diverticulitis without perforation or abscess is usually likely intravenous antibiotics. Antibiotics such as ciprofloxacin added with flagyl or metronidazole, which will cover anaerobic bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, or a single antibiotic therapy given intravenously, an example was one of my favorites was Envance, can also be used. If the patient does not improve on 24 to 48 hours of intravenous antibiotics and the patient develops signs of increasing sepsis or a increasing elevated white count or increasing abdominal pain, operative intervention or at a minimum radiological intervention such as percutaneous abscess drainage may be necessary. Antibiotic coverage for E. coli, bacteroides, and pseudomonas species should be given, mostly gram negatives, gram positives, and anaerobic bacterial species. Complicated diverticulitis causing obstructions or a stricture or a localized perforation with an abscess, fistula, or a free perforation will all initially be given antibiotics and bowel rest. 
Surprisingly, not all perforations require surgery. Not all fistulas require emergent surgery, and many abscesses will resolve with bowel rest, antibiotics, drainage, and time. The patient's treatment depends on their clinical presentation and, as I mentioned, not on their Hinchy category. When must surgical intervention for chronic, recurrent, uncomplicated diverticulitis be considered? Well, this depends on the patient's lifestyle, the availability of other healthcare services such as interventional radiology, and the continuing clinical examination of the patient, the overall health and age of the patient, and two or three or more documented episodes requiring antibiotics, loss of work, persistent pain, or recurrent symptoms should direct the physician to the proper treatment. Please note, in some cases, two episodes of diverticulitis may require surgical intervention, especially if it's in a young patient in their 20s or 30s, as recurrent diverticulitis in a young patient is more likely to recur and should be treated more aggressively because the risk of recurrence and complications over time is so much higher. However, each patient decision is made on an individualized basis. Surgery for acute diverticulitis is based on the technology available to the surgeon and the clinical assessment of the patient. The three-stage operation, shown on the following slides, is of mostly clinical and historical significance today. Patients who present with a perforation of the colon will have that area of the colon resected and usually require colostomy, leaving the rectum sewn over as a stump. This rectal stump is called a Hartman's pouch. In some patients, the patient may have a primary resection with or without a protecting ostomy and a reanastomosis fashioned, in other words, rejoining the intestine together. This is becoming more common but remains controversial. The purpose of the protecting ostomy is to divert stool away from a healing anastomosis. Some surgeons will operate on unprepped colon and perform a primary anastomosis. This is controversial and in my opinion is not yet the standard of care for a patient with perforated diverticulitis and signs of systemic sepsis. This will make sense as we look at some slides. Elective one-stage procedures performed laparoscopically can be done and some surgeons will now perform a laparoscopic washout of the peritoneal cavity without performing a colon resection. Studies are ongoing to assess whether resection is a must and whether the washout alone is safe. The jury's still out. One treatment for colon pathology of the sigmoid colon is to perform what's called a single loop ostomy. This is performed by making an incision just under the xiphoid process in the upper abdomen or under the left costal margin. A piece of transverse colon is brought out, opened up, and then sutured to the skin. This allows the patient who has an obstruction in the sigmoid colon to be worked up for a more definitive procedure while the point of the obstruction in the sigmoid colon can later be surgically resected, dilated, or viewed for biopsy at a less urgent time. The purpose of this diverting loop colostomy is basically temporary to allow the patient to have bowel movements without causing a bowel obstruction secondary to the distal sigmoid stricture or distal sigmoid obstruction caused from stricture or cancer. The three-stage procedure has been relegated to history. The patient presents with acute diverticular disease would have had a proximal diverting loop ostomy, a loop diverting colostomy like in the previous slide. This allows the patient to have bowel movements without stool traveling through the affected colon. Then after a period of six to eight weeks and after antibiotics have been given to reduce the acute inflammation, the patient's taken to the operating room where a segment of colon is removed and then a primary anastomosis is performed. Today, the two-stage procedure is considered in most areas of the United States as standard of care. The Hartman's procedure, i.e. the two-stage procedure, requires taking the patient to the operating room, resecting the affected area of colon, forming an end colostomy, and sewing over the rectum, i.e. a Hartman's pouch. The patient may have a few residual bowel movements of feces, 
through the rectal stump and normally through the anus, but once the rectal stump has been cleared of feces, it will only secrete mucus, i.e. also called a mucus fistula. The mucus fistula and Hartman's pouch are the same names for the same area of anatomy. After about six weeks or six months, depending, the patient is returned to the operating room, the abdomen is reopened, and the colon is attached to the rectal stump with a primary anastomosis. Diverticular disease is very costly in both terms of morbidity and lost work and wages to the patient. The image in the lower left shows a perforated diverticulum. This is a segment of colon that was removed at surgery. The image on the right shows the acute inflammatory changes seen during operation of the inflamed area of colon. These changes represent acute diverticulitis with the complication being perforation. Please click on the link to watch a laparoscopic left-sided colon resection being performed. This will serve as an introduction to the classification and treatment of colonic diverticular disease using surgery. The video opens with an image, laparoscopically, of the rectal stump, i.e. the Hartman's pouch, being penetrated from the anal area going more proximal into the rectum by one of our laparoscopic instruments. This will make more sense as the video is watched. In summary, we've learned diverticuli can occur anywhere throughout the GI tract. They can be false or pseudo-diverticuli or congenital, true diverticuli. Patients with symptomatic colonic diverticular disease present commonly with pain in the left lower quadrant. Bleeding is a symptom of diverticulosis of the colon and not of diverticulitis. We know diets containing peanuts, popcorn seeds, etc. do not cause or exacerbate diverticulitis by getting stuck in the diverticulum. Feces is stuck in the diverticulum, not seeds, not popcorn. We've also learned Hinchy staging, while adding to the description of the patient's finding, does not add to the care of the patient. It is only used to describe the severity of the patient's presentation. We've learned that complications of colonic diverticuli include abscess and infection, perforation, bleeding, strictures, and fistula formation. Thank you for your attention during this presentation on colonic diverticular disease. A small quiz follows containing multiple choice questions. If you have any questions or comments, please direct them to me via my email address.